Now, I think we've got another 40 years. Yeah, no, probably not. But it could be four years. But it could also be tomorrow. I mean, and this is, <laughs> here, that's the point. Um, when you wake up and all of a sudden there's a dollar crisis and your countrymen are lined up at ATM machines to get their $150 a day or whatever, you know, our masters decide we should have access to, um, you won't be able to buy precious metals at any price. A rare situation is allowing you to buy some ETF stocks for 50% off. Learn more at crushthestreet.com slash profit 2017. Hello, everyone, and welcome into crushthestreet.com. We're going to have a discussion today, which is a follow-up to a previous interview I conducted. However, it's with a first-time guest. Yes, yeah, so my guest today is Kevin Massengill, the founder and CEO of Mariglim Holdings, which is, has a creative new approach to predictive analytics in capital markets, which will improve performance and vindicate active investing. But his partner in this project is New York Times bestseller Jim Rickards with his latest book, Road to Ruin. And we discussed that book on my show not too long ago, and we're going to be doing a follow-up to that interview right here, right now with Kevin. And uh, let's get right into it. Kevin, thanks for joining me today at Crush the Street. Well, thanks, Kenneth. It's a real pr privilege to, uh, to be here and join you and your listeners. Of course. Well, I, I want to start off with the Fed and what they've done and kind of what the impact has been on interest rates. And one of the economic indicators that we are seeing right now is a flattening yield curve. And I, I presume the threat of an inverted yield curve. We know from historical data that this has been a clear sign of what investors are fearing in the future and a precursor to economic recession. So what are your thoughts on where we are right now? No, that's a great question. Um, so anytime you find yourself out on the fuzzy end of a 5,000 year unprecedented curve, you know, you gotta ask yourself, how do you think the story ends, mm. um, right? We're, we have never seen the sort of global debt to GDP numbers we're operating at. And right now, the entire world's debt to GDP is something around 325%. And even that's a, a really unhelpful measurement compared to something like debt to government revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Which would exactly tell you how much money they've got to, to handle the debt that they've taken on. What you're looking at is the end of a failed 40 year experiment. Um, and and when you listen to these people speak, when you listen to Fed governors or uh, Lagarde or Carney or Draghi or Yellen or any of them, here's a here's a, a way I recommend you think about listening to what they're saying. If if we were all sitting around and we listened to some guy get up and he's wearing short pants and a Smokey the Bear hat and he starts telling us in this very impassioned, excited language about how he and his fellow forest rangers really smart guys have collected a ton of data, they're gonna fix Yosemite. They're gonna make it better, they're gonna make it more efficient. You know, we're, we'd be looking at each other like, what the hell is this guy saying? We're gonna tweak the number of badgers, we're gonna fix the number of bears, we're gonna make Yosemite better, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody listening to him knows intuitively two things immediately. First of all, you know the guy's a knucklehead, right? He's just an idiot. Um, you're listening to the classic example of Hayek's fatal conceit, right? This idea that any, any person or group of people are ever going to have enough data to be able to actually do the things they think they're taking on. And we know instantly, as soon as he starts that, as soon as he starts making these changes, all he's going to get at the other end are a, kind of a banquet of unintended consequences, right? That he's now going to spend all his time trying to fix the problems he's already caused. So now transfer that you know, that, that, that absolute disbelief, you, you know, that you properly have when somebody gets in front of you and starts talking about how they're going to tweak these incredibly complicated, complex dynamic systems. And now picture Yellen and Draghi and Carney and Lagarde standing there talking just exactly like that idiot forest ranger about how they're going to fix the economy. 
right? Wow. <laughs> they're gonna wow. they're gonna dial up a little inflation. They're gonna dial down some unemployment. They're gonna they're gonna make it better, right? If you recognize that financial markets are this massive, gigantic auction, executing through price signals, right? All the all the decisions of the entire world's population in real time every day. Buy this, don't buy that. Save my money, spend my money. Every, you know, a millions of decisions made every day by you and every other market participant. That's real data. That's real market signals. And these clowns are going to get up and talk about how they're going to fix that, mm. right? They're going to they're going to make it better. You should recognize um, these aren't adults that are that are solving complicated problems that you can't quite understand. You should recognize and hold in contempt these people just exactly the way you would that forest ranger. In fact, next time you see Janet Yellen, picture her in short pants and a Smokey the Bear hat. You got the right idea. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Um, no. These people have no idea what they're doing. Kevin, so, well, one, I'll just jump in right there. Uh, it's it's in the <laughs> same vein, so I you can definitely continue, but. One of the things that I had read in the Federal Reserve's press release, it, it came right out of this. It says, on a 12-month basis, inflation has declined recently, and like the measure excluding food and energy <laughs> prices, is running somewhat below 2%. And, you know, I, for me, it's like, what's the deal with taking out the two most largest expenses that most people have when it right. comes, or I mean, it, second and third to housing, it, when calculating inflation in, in both of those numbers, as far as labor, uh, labor is being separate, and inflation being one of the most highly manipulated statistics in government statistics. And those are the two things that just so happens the Fed is most concerned about. So uh, continue <laughs> on with what you're saying. No, you're exactly right. So when you see that kind of just shameless behavior, um, you know they're in a box. They're not doing that because they want to. They're doing it because they have to, right? If, if if you actually reflect real inflation, government goes bankrupt immediately. It, it, everybody, and it's obvious to everyone. It's the same reason they're doing massive short selling of paper gold. It's just trying to keep a lid on a failing system so it doesn't blow up on their watch. That's all they care about, uh, getting their book deal and getting out of that before the explosion happens. That that's, you know, in their in their heart of hearts, lying, looking at the ceiling at two in the morning, wide awake, they are terrified. They have no idea what they're doing. Wow. You know, you know my my partner Jim Rickards once got a chance to buttonhole Ben Bernanke to ask him about this lunatic money printing QE thing, and and and. Bernanke actually said, well, you know, it's an experiment. <laughs> we, we won't know the outcome until, you know, years later when some future historian writes about it. Wow. What? <laughs> you know, it, that, it's the equivalent of let me destroy your incomes. Let me destroy your price signals. Let me destroy the value of your currency. Let me destabilize your society because I really feel strongly this is going to work out well. But, you know, really no idea. So wow. let, me, yeah, let me try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a shot in the dark uh, is the understatement of the week, right? Uh, Kevin, I want to talk about Bitcoin and then go into gold as it relates okay. uh, to the economy, both as they relate to the economy. And I know you cover fintech. You're very well versed in it. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what you see happening in Bitcoin and its future considering the current environment? Boy, that's a great question. So, um, well, let me first say, I, I think of myself uh, as an investor, not a speculator. And so, for me, a platform like Bitcoin is fascinating as a social signal, to quote Pippa Malmgren, it's a fantastic signal. Um, I don't view it as a great investment because like fiat currency, it has no intrinsic value. And so I am leery of anything 
um, that's basically tertiary level wealth. So if you think of primary wealth, it's what God gives us. Secondary wealth is what we do with what God gives us, right? He can give us access to iron ore and fisheries and hmm. yeah. herds of animal. We turn that into beef and fish and iron ore, right? Those right. are secondary levels of wealth. Tertiary levels of wealth are all the paper derivatives that come out of that futures contracts and stock certificates and all that. Now it's all legitimate and it's fine in its place and it's useful and it's it always emerges when you have sufficient surplus energy and the society can 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 evolve to that level. But it's also the first thing that's all wiped away you know, in the great corrective uh, crashes that have to happen. Um, and I fear that Bitcoin would be a casualty in that sort of a wipe out of tertiary assets. Now, that said, as a speculation, uh, it may be fantastic, right? People who bought in at $50 are, are sitting pretty, you know, pretty comfortable right now. So if, as a speculation, it's probably as good as any. Um, I, I don't speculate, so I'm, I'm a poor person to ask. Um, so from an investment standpoint, it would make me uncomfortable because I, I don't trust governments. I don't trust um, their uh, intentions toward it, their ability to just wake up one day and outlaw it or intercept it or wipe it out or false flag attack it or any number of things that they could do if they really decided they want to. Um, but that said, as a signal, using Pippa Mongren's way of thinking about this, it is a fantastically interesting signal that the world is waking, at least some segment of the world, is waking up to the inherent risk they see in fiat currencies, right? This isn't just a, a phenomena of what's available by way of technology. I view this also as a phenomena of a social signal of people voting with their, their wallets to get to, to, to reduce the exposure they feel in government's fiat currency regimes. And in, in, in that regard, as a signal, Bitcoin and the emergence of all the cryptocurrencies, I find really interesting. Sure. Uh, because at the end of the day, fiat currencies are simply a confidence game. They're not backed by anything other than your confidence that tomorrow somebody will accept it in exchange for goods and services. The right. rise of these cryptocurrencies is a reflection of the diminishment of that confidence. And right. The, yeah. You know, I, and I I've had the conversations w about that with other people. And yeah, I, I've come around to believe in it a little more than just a, a fiat paper and, and the confidence that we put into it, because it's not it, because of the technology that's behind it, of course. And I don't want to get into that with you or, or even. No, I it. love the blockchain. Oh, I think that's the, one of the greatest advances since double entry accounting. I, you know, I think blockchain is absolutely absolutely going to revolutionize business and and uh and economics and how how chains of tr uh, transmittal and confidence can be done as i i am with you i love the technology i mean transferring I'm, money across borders literally just turning your computer on the other side your your bitcoin is there we're seeing the benefit of that happening absolutely. across the world with people absolutely i couldn't agree more that's a functional or transactional value and i you know there's other than gold i, I can't imagine anything that serves as good a purpose in that role um but again, that said, I just want to distinguish the difference between that and buying it as a speculative investment because you think it necessarily has to go to 10000 or whatever the latest projections are. It might, but it might not. And so I just I, I would use it as a transactional mechanism like you just described, um, and I would tend to keep my assets in real tangible silver, gold, bullion held outside the country, tangible real estate, income-producing agricultural real estate, um, you know, things that are closer and closer back to primary levels of wealth that will more than likely survive this great rebalancing. Well, I like the way you put that. Primary stores of wealth in that number one sector, number two sector. Um, cryptocurrencies have stolen the limelight, let's be honest here, of gold and silver. And a lot of people who have been concerned of, about the economy have invested in gold and silver and have been on the sidelines when it has come to to bitcoin and you know ethereum now and some of these other ones mm -hmm. 
Uh, so let's just get your thoughts here on gold and silver and has the move in, in Bitcoin, you know, you think a lot of this money, this capital that has entered this crypto space is going to go into gold and silver when we do see them move or, or do you even think that's going to happen? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think it doesn't matter, and I'm, and I'm not being flip. Here's why I say that. Um, the amount of money that's invested in Bitcoin is such a tiny percentage of the world's wealth that it's almost unmeasurable. Um, and, and you can almost say the same thing about gold, quite frankly. Right. Mm -hmm. Both of them constitute such a tiny percentage of the world's assets. There's a... I recommend your your listeners pull up a recent infographic that was done by Visual Capitalist, mm -hmm. and they have a breakout of the world's assets. And the final three pages of your computer screen as you're scrolling through, looking at these blocks stacked up to you get to the bottom, is the the quadrillions of derivatives. But at the very top of the page, it starts with a pinpoint on the page that represents Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and, and again, well, that, that almost sounds bullish better. for Bitcoin then. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, I just, again, I have, I, I view that as part of a tertiary level of wealth that I can't control. Mm. Uh, where, I, where if I have gold and silver bullion in a vault outside the banking system, outside uh, political risk jurisdictions like the U.S., um, then I'm more comfortable than a Bitcoin that fascinating as the technology is and as incredibly useful in its transactional capability as it is, I just don't trust that I couldn't wake up tomorrow and find out the NSA just wiped all their servers. I just, uh, maybe that's completely Luddite naivete on my part, but, you know, again, I just am, am leery of long-term investments in things that lack intrinsic value, sure. that's all. Well, uh, one of the things that Bitcoin we've seen and, and many of the gold analysts have admitted to this is that it's it's not manipulated. It's an unable to be manipulated. And maybe you disagree with that, but that's not really what I want to ask you. The, the problem right now is gold and silver have been largely manipulated. And <laughs> the problem is that we're not seeing those go up uh, in, in the in the face of manipulation. So what are your thoughts on that? Are we gonna are we gonna get through this? Is JP Morgan gonna win this battle or, or uh, is there some hope for those of us holding gold and silver? Oh, it's a great question. I, you know I view I view this as watching people shoving a uh, beach ball ever farther under the water. Good luck. <laughs> right. You you know how this story ends, and it always ends the same way. There's always a rebalancing. There's always a time when the world's fiat currencies blow up. Nobody trusts each other's currencies. They have no intrinsic value. So everybody's currencies are reset against the amount of gold that country owns. Mm -hmm. That's how the story always ends. And so that's why guys like Jim Sinclair in the 70s, when gold spiked up to $200 an ounce from just 35 a few years earlier, and then it collapsed 50% all the way down to 100. People were just distraught, despondent. Man, they, were just, they were just horrified. And Jim Sinclair came out. Now, remember, gold had been $35 an ounce, went to 200 now it's at 100 And Jim Sinclair comes out and says, actually, gold's going to have to go to about $850 an ounce. And people thought he was insane. They just thought that was just speculative nonsense. And actually, all he did was divide the amount of M2, I think was the calculation he was using, the, the amount of currency that the government had flooded the world with, divided by the amount of gold they claimed to have had, 8000 8000 <laughs> And and did the math, right? And that's what came out, eight hundred fifty. And and you know, all of a sudden, five years later, six years later, it hits eight hundred fifty dollars an ounce. And you know, he looks like a genius. Well, interestingly enough, that guy, Jim Sinclair, still around, is doing the same math and says, "All right, divide the M two by the gold we claim to have in the central bank uh, or in the federal government." 
and gold has to, and, and, and gold has to go to fifty thousand dollars an ounce. Same math. And, and when you hear that, the immediate reaction is just to roll your eyes and go, ah, it's just crazy. Okay. Now, pull up the chart that shows the federal government on a whim creating four and a half trillion dollars of currency, right? Yep. yep. And, and, and ask yourself, okay, what do you think that just did to the value of the dollar, right? Vis-a-vis -vis your own gold holdings. Um, so the way this story will end um, is overnight there's going to be a failure, a crisis of confidence. And I don't know what's going to cause it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I think it's going to be. Um, you know, my, my partner Jim loves to use the complexity science example of a, an avalanche. Um, you know, you can look at the unstable snowpack and know what's about to happen without having to be able to calculate which particular snowflake is going to cause it, mm -hmm. right? You just know if you either fire cannons or go ahead and disrupt that and let that thing come down before it kills the skiers in the afternoon, you know it's an unstable mass and it's going to come apart. That's yeah. as much as you need to know. It's the same thing with this situation, right? You know, you know, owning precious metals in this day and age is a vote of no confidence against a, a world of hubris and arrogance and ignorance and central bankers and governments that are buying votes, just printing currency, destroying the value of their currency, uh, destroying their savers, wiping out their pensioners. And this is an old, old story. <laughs> and it always ends the same way. Um, so when does that last avalanche, you know, would, when that last snowflake kick the avalanche? And I, I wouldn't begin to understand. You know, people who recognized this was coming thought that we wouldn't get through the 70s, right? When we broke the link to the gold, when Nixon uh, severed the, the dollar from gold, people rightly understood the danger that that posed and thought we wouldn't get through the 70s. Well, here we've been 40 years. Now, I think we've got another 40 years. Yeah, no, probably not. But it could be four years. But it could also be tomorrow. I mean, and that's, <laughs> here, that's the point. Um, when you wake up and all of a sudden there's a dollar crisis and your countrymen are lined up at ATM machines to get their $150 a day or whatever, you know, our masters decide we should have access to, um, you won't be able to buy precious metals at any price. Now, there'll be a quoted price, but you won't get any. Some sovereign wealth funds might be able to buy it. Guys like Kyle Bass might be able to get some, but you won't. It won't matter what the price is. Um, doesn't matter what's quoted. There just won't be any available. And so this is the kind of thing where, you know, gold investors love to say, yeah, I, I'd rather be a year early than a day late. Wow. Um, Don't want to so, miss that train. Yeah, because when the door closes, there's literally no way for you to get back on it. I mean, they will, in my opinion, and, and this, Jim actually has made the case for why he thinks it's $10,000, and he bases the 10000 on what they did to restore the gold standard, um, uh, I think just after World War One, they used a 40% of M2 calculation. And and Jim's done the math on that and said, okay, with today's money printing, that 40% would turn gold to about $10,000 an ounce. And so that's the what he calls the implied non-deflationary price of gold. Right. So if you if you wanted to get your hands around this, you as the government, if you wanted to 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 really help wipe out the debt and restore the economy and put the economy back on sound footing, put the dollar back on sound footing, you declare, you know, we'd wake up, there'd be a bank holiday, they shut the banks for four days, and at the other end of it, they'd say, okay, uh, there's a new dollar, you're going to turn in your old dollars ten for one, um, and. Gold is effectively ten thousand dollars an ounce, but because it's a new dollar at ten for one, you know we're pricing the new dollar at at uh, one thousand dollars per ounce, right? One thousand uh, dollars per ounce in the new dollar. Right. So they've effectively just defaulted to ten thousand dollar gold, and then recalled all the cash, and they'll you know spin the story, and their their corrupt media will spin the story. This is great. You're screwing over the drug dealers and everybody else that has cash, and isn't this a great idea? Blah blah blah. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, but your dollars will have just effectively been expropriated ninety percent. Um, you, your dollar was worth a dollar when you went to sleep. When you wake up, it's worth ten cents in purchasing power. That's how they'll do this. 
You know, Kevin, I, I want to highlight what you said about the train leaving the station being one second too late. And it really, man, our most recent example of this, is, I know I keep going back to it, is Bitcoin. How many people kept saying they may have wanted to buy Bitcoin, but it was a bubble at 800 and then it moves to 1300 <laughs> and like, okay, I'm going right. to wait for it to go back to 800, but then it goes to 1500 and then 1300 looked like a good deal. And that, and it kept going, it kept going till it hit about 3000. And that was a moment that I was in my mind going, this, what it, this is what it feels like to to try to get in something while it's doing its thing and this is what it's going to feel like when gold exactly and silver right. does its really thing you're going to you're going to wait for it to go back to 1200 to 1250 Correct. and because those numbers will just seem fantastic to you they just won't seem realistic right you're not going to want to buy a 1500 because you haven't seen it there in a while and then it's going to go to 1800 and you're like oh i should have bought a 1500 <laughs> and it, the psychology that investors deal with on a, a present basis just right. cannot be on I, I you have to prepare for that and it's always best to just be on <laughs> on the train before that happens so you almost don't even have to deal with it you're just ready for it <laughs> Yeah. So Jim would tell you, Jim would recommend at least 10% of your assets in gold. Um, I would, I would say at least 50%, but I'm a little more conservative about that than he is. Um, <laughs> and, and that's the, you, you just file it away and forget it, right? You just bank it and people will, you know, it's humorous. The, the, the status will say, well, you know, gold doesn't pay any dividends. It, it doesn't generate any income. Okay. Plot gold against every currency in the world since the last market turning in 2000, and gold's outperformed all of them substantially. Right. Yeah. You know, so, so that's just a canard. I mean, it's just nonsense. And this idea that somehow gold doesn't earn anything. Okay, hold up a dollar bill. Is it is it dropping off new dollars? What are you talking about? It's a tr unit of transaction. You can't eat it either. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> the the difference is. A uh, hundred years from now, that gold will have its purchasing power still, and your dollar will be an interesting museum piece, just like my Iraqi money that's got Saddam Hussein's face on it. It's kind of a novelty, kind of cool. Can't buy anything with it. Sure, sure. Um, well, uh, Kevin, let's talk about Mariglim. What are you guys offering? And, you know, you, we've obviously talked a lot about value, you know, where you see value. Um, so w what is it that you guys do, and how, how does it help people? No, it's a, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for asking. So, so w when Jim and I started down this path, um, let's start at nine one one. So after nine eleven, the agency is interested in trying to figure out how they can use financial data to predict the next major terrorist attack. As you may recall, there were anomalous shortings in the markets of airline stocks, defense stocks, seventy two to forty eight hours ahead of the attacks. And it, so Jim was on that team that helped pull that together. And the answer is yes, you could find those anomalies. And they did. Um, and for, for domestic political reasons, I won't bother to go into it. At, at some point, the agency closed it down, not because it didn't work, but because it was, it was domestic political exposure to them. Um, Jim and I met, I was running the Middle East for one of the U.S. defense contractors. And Jim was a speaker at a conference in Bahrain, and I had read his book, Currency Wars, and it talked a little bit about this Project Prophecy, the CIA program. And I, I was fascinated by his book, and I was interested to meet him, and we just got to, 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 to get to know each other there and really hit it off. And, and at that meeting, we discussed whether or not this was a platform that could actually be bent into the service of, of not just government agencies, but major institutional investors. Right. If you can see the future and it's that's an anomaly, but if you can see what, what it appears to people that you can see the future, uh, Jim would say the future is already present in the data. Um, you know, a, a nice way to think about it is if you're staring at a domino, you can you can make a lot of predictions about the domino. You can see a lot of facts about it. But if you pull back to where I'm standing, you can see that it's actually one domino and a whole chain of. Right. That's all. If I can see the first domino being tipped over. I can give you a pretty accurate description of what's coming. <laughs> no, but you, if you're just looking at the one domino, you can't see it. And it'll appear magical that I called it in advance. Mm -hmm. It's not prediction. It's just seeing the data. Um, that's all. So 
what we've done is we've we've taken the math and science that was applied against this problem after 9-11. So let's say you and I are intelligence analysts. Towers have come down, it's, it's the day after 9-11. The last thing our boss wants to hear is us give us the typical quant answer, which is, you know, we just don't have enough data. But after another four or five of these kind of incidents, we'll start to get enough data. We can start doing correlations, regressions, mean reversion. Right. You, you get, mm-hmm. Nobody's going to take that answer. So what the intelligence community does is something called Bayesian inference. That's 200-year-old math. But it's just simply positing a hypothesis, giving it your best guess, and then rationally thinking through all of the indications and warnings that you could expect to see to help validate that hypothesis or help refute the hypothesis and, and, and cause you to, to think better or get more accurate data, right? That's Bayesian inference. What we've done is we've married Bayesian inference, quite common in the intelligence community. We've married that to behavioral psychology, complexity science, computing with words, textual inference, and historical perspective. And if you're, uh, if you and I were scientists at Los Alamos, we use complexity science every day. It's Sixty-year-old math. We we use it to model nuclear weapons. You know, in in tests we can't conduct underground anymore. There's all kinds of things that are being used for complexity science. But for whatever reason, all of this has just simply bypassed the financial industry, the governments, the central banks, and the financial industry practitioners. They've just let it, all of this math and science, just go by them. That's why I joke, uh, we're Copernicus. You know, Jim's comment once, um, Jim Rickard's comment was, you know, 70 years from now, the world would catch up. You know how science advances with the death of one tenured professor at a time. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so 50, 70 years from now, they would come around to understanding that financial markets are complex adaptive systems. They don't lend themselves to the beautiful physics math that you know today's economists try to try to apply efficient market theory or value at risk models and all the just nonsense. Elegant math, but completely inappropriate. Completely non-valid to real complex adaptive systems. So what we've done is we have taken, uh, the, we're the first firm in the world to offer predictive data analytics as a service um, in capital markets using complexity science and human intelligence, this combination to improve performance and validate active investing. So the typical quant firm is is using ever larger machines, ever larger data sets. Um, they are looking for correlations, regression, mean reversion. If every time it rains in Brussels, I see a correlation, the gold goes up. I don't care if I understand why or if there is a, even is a connection. Next time it rains in Brussels, buy gold. Right? That's the quant model. That's they assume stationary linear relationships between variables. Now the problem with that is one, it has no no linkage to reality whatsoever, right? These sort of variables can actually reverse over time or degrade their relationship. There's there's nothing there. And as the markets embrace quantitative trading, which they're doing more and more as a as the only answer they know that works against this, this move to passive and indexing, then the markets themselves will face challenges from herding, signal amplification, recursive reaction functions, all the problems that attend that. So... Here's the point. Capital markets are complex, dynamic systems. And to understand them, to model them properly, requires a complex, dynamic model, simply put. Now, so we use sophisticated math and data mining, but we are not quants. So what we've done is taken complexity science and human intelligence. And we don't start with big data and look for some loose correlation between the rain in Spain and the price of gold. What we do is we instrument subject matter expert narratives. So take somebody who's really, really smart in a field. Take Pippa Malmgren or Stephanie Pomboy or Kyle Bass or Jim Rickards. Take the narrative that they build on a story. Take that narrative and out of that extract or identify the conceptual components, the causal linkages, their corresponding strengths, and imagine putting that into a map of bubbles, right, circles with the lines drawn between them. What you've done is taken the, the expert narrative and turned that into a visual element. That visual element, we convert into an algorithm and run the numbers. So now what you've done is you've instrumented the expert narrative, 
You've identified the concepts, the causal linkages. Then you partner with a fantastic partner like we have with IBM, and we turn Watson loose on absorbing where they read 9 million things a day in every language. They listen to all the video transcripts, right? Mm -hmm. So now you've got these maps, these visual fuzzy cognitive maps. We have Watson doing the analysis on every one of those nodes, changes inputs to those nodes, slightly better, slightly less, more different. And then the algorithm runs, run it a thousand times because it's all integrated. And what you get at the end is a footprint of uncertainty, to use the language my chief data scientist would smile to hear me parrot from him. <laughs> and, and what you get at the end may appear um, not obvious to the layman, but it is completely, profoundly different from the quant models. So we are literally talking, starting with human intelligence, filtering that through complexity science and using big data artificial intelligence to populate the nodes. Remember I said we would we would think about those indications and warnings? If, if we're right, what should we expect to see? Well, then it's Watson that's out there scanning the world's input to look for those indications and warnings, something no human could do. But absent our human narrative, our human intelligence, Watson wouldn't know what to do with the data, right? It wouldn't, sure. it wouldn't know how to apply meaning to what it's seeing. So it's that combination of complexity science and human intelligence we think is so profoundly different than anything else that's out there. Well, that's incredible. And uh, so I, I guess my, my next question is if people want to, to reach out to you and learn more about what you're doing, where would they go? And what exactly are, are you guys offering them? Thanks. So um, that's so there's two ways to think about that. First thing, uh, I would recommend you go to our website, maragleam.com, M-E-R-A-G-L-I-M. Um, and, and one quick side note, um, when Jim and I were thinking about what to name this, com this uh, company, we wanted to convey the idea of active reconnaissance. And, you know, in a former life, I was a, a soldier and a, um, uh, a scout platoon leader. My, you know, my, my mission and my men was to go out and find the enemy and get back without getting killed. Um, and, and we wanted that idea. We wanted to capture that idea of going to look for trouble, going to look for opportunities. And, and Maragleam, so we went through Latin, Greek, Hebrew dictionaries, and Maragleam, which uh, I, I'd known the story all my life, but I never knew it had a name, is the Hebrew proper noun for the name of the the twelve man reconnaissance team that was made up of the twelve crown princes of the twelve tribes that Moses sends into the promised land hmm. in Numbers thirteen. Uh, famously, the ten come back wailing, crying about the risks, and Joshua and Caleb um, um, are historically famous for identifying the opportunities. And Jim and I thought this is a perfect allegory for what we're trying to do, to go out, find the risks, find the opportunities, and, and kind of report back to our clients. So that's what Maragleam. The Maragleam is the Hebrew name of that 12-man reconnaissance team. How cool is that? That is cool. Yeah. Um, so, so two ways to think about the value prop. So for anybody that's, that's managing big amounts of money, Follow that website, follow uh, the press releases. Uh, we'll be announcing something with IBM this week. Um, and when you're interested, let us know and we'll come talk to you. Um, as we do the, we've already written the algorithms, as we do the integration with Watson, we're going to be looking for some fantastic industry participants to sit and join that development program gratis just to, to take their counsel and get their advice and, and help shape that, uh, that whole process. So we'd love to have that conversation. We've got a, a number that have already volunteered and love to do it. We'd love to have some more. Um, on the on the investment side, we're about two weeks, maybe three weeks away from opening the data room to accredited investors. Uh, we're going to launch an A-series raise. Jim and I have financed this all to date. Uh, and now we're getting ready to open it up to accredited investors. Our fantastic uh, broker-dealer, WealthForge, will manage all of that so it's all completely compliant. But again, get on Maragleam.com, click on any of the articles, um, or click on the contact us page, give us your email address, and we'll just keep you in the loop as that goes forward. So if you're interested in a, you know, in a private placement in this absolutely unique intersection of complexity science and human intelligence, going to tackle some of the hardest problems in the world 
you know, this is a great way for you to to uh, to participate and join us. Wow. So, well, very exciting. Uh, an opportunity to partner with you and uh, Jim Rickards, uh, Marigleam. Uh, Kevin, I, I want to, first of all, thank you for your time coming on Crush the Street and just sharing your knowledge and, and years of expertise and experience and, and research that you've done in the markets and uh, this awesome opportunity to be able to be involved with what you're offering going forward here. So uh, thanks again for coming on the show with me. Well, it's my pleasure and, and quite an honor, Kenneth. You run a, a fantastic show. You have great guests and, and you have great subscribers, and it's just a real honor for us to be able to join you today. Awesome, sir. Well, hey, I appreciate that. Uh, we will talk soon.